Hello, peoples of the internet. Today we will be building a rival for the 1953 Burnside Special. This isn't the body we'll be using, but I just had to show it you for these wheels. They look crazy. But on a more serious note, there's many vintage style of bodies we can use here. I believe these ones are far too small, but we can get crazy mid-engine designs and stuff if we want to build a sports car. Naturally though, I won't be going with them. Seems it's either that one or this one. And this is definitely the most American of them. It's got a kind of Bel Air look to it, so it just suits the kind of rival we're trying to build here. <laughs> wow, you can do crazy things with a design. I don't think we will be doing too crazy things with a design though. We'll be just building a very aggressive style of vehicle. So, we need some fins on the way, definitely. I'm thinking of having the way quite squared off, actually, so we can have improved weight balance. I mean, I can move the front end back, like, not there, but there. But I feel that just looks a little strange, and I don't want to do that. I'd much rather extend the way. The 1964-ish Chevrolet Impala actually had a really ridiculous style of, what do you call it, boot. That had a really long boot on it. Now, I seem to have chosen a two-door. There's also a four-door, but I've already styled this one now. Now we're going with a four-door. The Burnside is a four-door. Just do the same crucial modifications, perhaps. Bring that. Bring the white parts out, hopefully, if it lets me. There we go. And then, hopefully bring those into right position. No chrome on the door pillars, that's odd. I'm pretty sure the Americans would have put chrome on the door pillars back in the day. They had chrome on everything. Unless, of course, it was some weird style feature, also possible. Not that I mind, chrome is very nice. Wooden chrome, my favourite materials in car design. Now here we've got a galvanised steel unitary construction. Although I don't think we want that actually. The Burnside's a ladder. I mean I was just messing around setting this stuff up and yeah I've really messed with it a bit too much because we either use steel or galvanised for solidity and Improve corrosion, I will use galvanised. We can put the engine in the back. And that changes the colour of the ladder for some reason. Even though it's made of the exact same material. That's strange. Same basic shape as well. Now, I could make it rear engine, but I feel this body was just designed with front engine in mind. Now we'll be going with trailing arm rear suspension. Since it should just give me better refinement all round. And that's very odd. I mean, automation doesn't seem to let you go with McPherson struts on the front anymore. I'm sure you used to be able to, but you can't do that anymore, which is strange. I feel like I might as well just go with double wishbone all round then. Which is better for comfort though. Comfort is a crucial thing here. So we have average, low, very low. That's what the Burnside used, I believe. Solid axle lead. Since double wishbone is the best we can get for comfort, we'll just use that. We'll be making it out of steel as well, since aluminium can't be mass produced. Now, the bodywork. I'll just skip through this and then you can join me when I'm done to talk through it.
Okay, so I've built the car's design up now. I originally went with that grill down here and the indicators and the headlights as the predominant features of the car, but then I had the kind of nose as I kept thinking of it as, and that was a bit plain, so I added some chrome around there. I had to add a grill on the front since we have no just pure chrome grills that I know of. It looks okay though. I mean, there's a bit of a gap, but I think that's passable enough. I think, like, you're not going to notice it unless you start looking closely at the car. We have chrome door handles of a kind of retro style. As a matter of fact, I can move that one up a little more. It's a little funny. We also have the rear end. I actually use some kind of futuristic tail lights here. I fear I've ruined the indicators worse. You go over there for the time being. Those indicators have actually wrecked my boot. Just when I thought things were getting better. I mean, you saw before that it was all okay. Now we're going longitudinal rear wheel drive. It's just natural for a vehicle like this. Could go with longitudinal front wheel drive. Might save a bit of weight. But nah, it's just a traditional car. Other than the engine, which we're going to experiment a little with. Now, yellow makes it look slightly like a taxi, but I don't know, I think it's a little too much. I think what we want is a kind of dark red colour would look good on this. I did design it in red after all, we just need a darker shade of it. Something like this. Looks a little faded, but it still looks nice in my book. Kind of burgundy, would you call it? I think that looks quite good on it. Quite classy, yet slightly angry at the same time. Now we can go with V8, V12, flat plane V8. Or inline 3, 4 and 6. Yeah, I'm amazed you can use inline 3s, but you can't use V6s, which are essentially inline 3s joined together. Let's see then how this monster of an engine does. Pretty good. 57.3, <laughs> but remember we've got plenty to tune. So I'll do some tuning and then I'll return. Okay, so I've got 161 without even trying, which is pretty decent power. But then everything's glowing red, so I need to do some messing around and then return again. Now, interestingly, I've got a very similar displacement, but I've shuffled it to be quite biased to the bore, and now I've lost 20 horsepower, which I can't seem to get back. It's very strange indeed. So maybe I'll have to go for closer to a square engine and see how that affects it. Okay, so I've not even readjusted the compression yet, and already the square engine is looking better. I've actually got more bore still, but it's a lot squarer than it was. So if I just take to the compression, let's see. Yep, we can build up power more easily. Now I'm trying to beat an engine that my commenter, one of my commenters has made, which has 297 newton meters of torque. It doesn't look like I'm standing a chance of that. I mean, it is a smaller engine than the one I've built, but... The power's here, it's just not torque. Torque has never been my strong point. Also, RPM, I'm revving it too low. And I might be having bottom end problems. Yep. Bottom end problems. So, I'll have to try and mess around some more and see just what I can do with it. Okay, so I've finally got an engine that I think I'm happy with. Yes, it's massively bore bias, but... I had to do that since otherwise it wouldn't web at all and it wouldn't make power at all because I would be cutting off the RPM so soon. Now, you'll see there's no size problems whatsoever so it's not like there's going to be an issue fitting an engine like this into a car. You'll see it's low enough, it's narrow enough and it's short enough to fit in the car. <laughs> We're saying that about a 4 litre in line 6. I've still got the 4 valve cylinder single overhead cam. It works. I mean, I might get more of dual overhead cam, but I can't really justify it. Like, I'm making as much power as I could need from this car. Now, the conrods and pistons, I actually ended up going with heavy duty because it's more torquey 
than it is high webbing, if you see what I mean. And quality's all on zero. I was able to get the power I wanted like that. Cam profile is quite high at 72. I mean, I've had to web it right to 4900 RPM, which doesn't sound like that much, but it really is when you're talking 50s technology, because it doesn't want to web at all. As I've said, that's why I had to hike the bore right up, because it doesn't want to. And now that means it makes the power at the very top of a web range with no drop-off, but how else was I supposed to make the power I truly wanted? The carburetors, I've had to invest in these, I mean, you'll see the power will drop off if I change even one thing here. Triple single barrel carburetors is as good as I can get. Intake is standard, and the fuel is regular leaded again. As a matter of fact, we could probably run it on low quality. But hey, regular should be fine. Fuel mixture is also lean, and ignition timing is 77. It's all precisely tuned to give me the power I want. Same with the exhaust, 2.5 inches. And we've got the same mufflers and everything like that. Now, the power. <laughs> I'm actually doing incredibly well here. The torque is still lower than the burn size, yet the torque is more than the engine I'm competing with. And the horsepower is 204. That's the part I'm most impressed with here, honestly. But I was able to get 204 horsepower out of it. Now, the engine, the, the commenter built, had 297 torques, so I'm 6 torques ahead. And I had 160 horsepower, though, so naturally I'm 44 horsepower ahead. You won't be able to use that power for very long at all, though. But it's got the power, so I'll claim what I can. I mean, I'll show you now with the RPM, though. If I do change that, it'll have problems. Like, 5,000, the bottom end starts failing. <laughs> it's a shame, because we could say it webs to 5,000 if it did. It's almost as if it's just being spiteful. Seriously, though, it works. The only real disadvantage is the price. It's around $400 um, dollars more expensive. But I can permit that, I think. You know, $400 in the grand scheme of things isn't too much. Like, I'll just have to cheap out on the seats or something. But the engine is a true marvel, I think, for the era it comes from. It's probably one of the best inline sixes you'll find before 1955, actually. So, I'm happy. I mean, I've not built the best engine in the world here. But I've achieved what I wanted to. It's fairly economical for the time and the power it creates. The weight is terrible. It weighs 272.7 kilograms, although that is 0.6 of a kilogram lighter than the engine my commenter built. So hey, I've built an engine that's better in every way other than price. Then so it's to be expected. You'll get what you pay for. I mean, you get a better engine here, but then boy, do you have to pay for it. Still, it is a mass-producible engine, I believe. It's not too ridiculous. You'll see there, plenty of space in the engine bay. There could be more if I used a 2-litre inline 4 or something, but it's perfectly fine, I think. Now, we'll go with a automatic or a manual. The automatic can only be a 2-speed, despite the burn side having 3-speeds, so I think it has to be a manual just because I don't want a 2-speed transmission in this thing. Also, when the top speed is this high, I mean, I know it's not stupidly high, but you have to respect that it's a 200 horsepower car of this size, so to go 118 is fairly impressive, to push itself through the air that well. Now, I don't think we want an automatic locker on here. It's just another thing to go on, although I say that, back in the 60s in America, they had everything electronic, so, you know, they take the risks where they can. And I think I want a manual locker, though, because the tyres aren't going to have a huge amount of grip here, so just to stop it getting stuck in mud and stuff, we want that extra feature. And we can advertise for it, too. We're going to plus three quality again, since we're off the engine. I mean, if I turn the quality up, I could do so much better, but I got 200 horsepower. That's the number I'm happy with, and over 300 torques, too. Now, the, the tyres... It's on 15 inches at the moment, as you'll see. I 
I'm not happy with it. Now, quality can go up. <laughs> now, what brakes have we got? We've got drums on the front. I'm guessing 2LS is more powerful. We'll just have to use a brake size, really. Unfortunately, there's not that much we can do with a size, though, because the wheels are so small. I mean, you'll see those brakes are struggling to fit in there. Although it does look like it could fit wider brakes. It does look like they're struggling to fit in there, which is interesting. I think we'll go with plus 60. Or plus 10, technically. 50 is middling. We really want to make sure this thing stops. So if given it slightly more waste drive brakes does that, then that's what we'll accept. Because I say so. Now, we have an off-road skid tray and a standard skid tray. I'm not sure what that does. I'm guessing it's just a plate that goes underneath. Either way, I think it might be useful and it's not too expensive. Just, you know, in case you scrape it on a curb or something, it's that extra bit of protection. Downforce, well, it doesn't matter. It's the 50s. Who needs downforce? We want it to take off and fly into space. We don't want it to stick itself to the road. Now that's interesting though. You'll see it had like 809. Maybe even a thousand if I turn the brake cooling off. Yeah, it's a thousand kilojoules a second of cooling. And that's fascinating actually because it means that it can go quicker than it was. 132 now. It was having a lot of drag acting on it, so this engine must be a lot more capable than I'm thinking it is. I mean, it's hard to say something I made is great and good and all, and I'm probably exaggerating just because I'm proud of my inline 6, but I still think, compared to what the Burnside was capable of, it is reasonably impressive. We can have six seats, which presumably is bench seats, front and rear, so we'll go with that. To be honest, I don't know what the difference between four and six would be. I'm guessing it's just putting seat belts there, because every car from America of this era that I know of used bench seats. I'm not very multicultural, I know. It's surprising that you can actually get a sport interior of this day. I'm guessing that's just slightly sportier seats, and that's it. It was simpler times back then. Now, I'm suspecting we want a premium interior. Yeah, it's not a luxury limited production car. It's supposed to be mass produced, so we'll accept that. We'll go with a luxury radio, though, you know. Give you all the things you could possibly want in your car. Just give it with a slightly subpar quality. I mean, the Americans in the 1960s had pretty much everything, let's be honest. Now, we want advanced 1950s safety. <laughs> well, we don't have much option with the springs. It's double wishbones, but it's very standard double wishbones. No fancy technology here. And I want to see my car. I'm just happy with it, you know. It's not the best car in the world, but as an overall package, I like it. We're going to set up for comfort. It has to float. It's the standards of the day, I mean... Some people will hate cars that float and are really soft. I like them. The weight is actually very, very light. 1585.6 kilograms. It might be helped by the fact that it's using a slightly smaller engine with an aluminium head. Maybe. And we've not named it yet. So, while I'm filling time with my speech, I might as well name the vehicle. We're going to call it the... Fire Mobile. Look, I'm trying to think of things that are related to burn, okay? And I come up with fire. Now, what's variant? Lux SE Radio, with the base model presumably not even having a radio. <laughs> You're lucky to have what you have, okay? Now, the engine can be called. Hmm. Raining fire. No, wait. Chevrolet had the blue flame in line six back in the day. So, I'm going to call it the green flame in line six. It has nothing to do with the kind of colour that 
the combustion happens at just because we're trying to compete with Chevrolet without copying all their marketing terms and this can be super variant of it <laughs> the other version presumably being unsuper now here we have it crazy vehicle I just want to do some final adjustment on the gearbox and then I think I'll be done so top speed is a little high top speed seems to fluctuate like one moment it's going I'm a supercar I can go crazy speeds and then the next moment it can't yeah we've only got four gears so we don't really want to go stretching them all over the place trying to get better economy out of it Mm, I think I'll have to set it for 130. It's actually fairly quick to not from 0 to 60. I know it's under 12 seconds, but respective of its day and respective that it's on 165 tyres, and I'm just making it slower. I'll leave it at 11.9. Also gives me 12 miles per gallon. But all in all, for a 200 horsepower car of this day, I don't mind it. I mean, I just wish I could have a bit of runoff space, but then that would cause bottom end problems for the engine, and I really don't want that. And I want 200 horsepower without forcing the engine price up to stupid levels, so I've done what I can. Can we kind of look through here? There we go. We could just take the body off by using this handy slider here. There we go. There's our drive line in all its transparent glory. It looks very strange. It's like, this is what happens when you take apart one of our cars. This is what happens when you take apart one of our rivals' V8s. Although in terms of packaging, I actually think this might be better than the V8s. Because you just see how it has a nice space all around the engine. The V8 would have a lot of space in front of it, but not a huge amount of space to the sides of it. So, that wouldn't be ideal. Anyway, enough procrastination, let's go. Okay, so I've got the time from the car as an 11 minute 42 time. It's not very impressive really. However, it is within 20 seconds of a 1939 Mercedes race car, which I don't believe is too bad, respective of the monster this thing is. Also, the 0 to 60 is pretty appalling. I mean, the burn side is quicker, but I believe it's with good reason. I believe it's because of the way the torque comes on. If you look at my engine, it's very much a race engine, you'll see. It's got a lot of build-up to the power, but then there's not much there. Almost like an engine you might find in a Ferrari or Lamborghini. There's the build-up, and then there's just nothing. You have to shift and lose all your power. But I was so desperate to get the power. And I mean, honestly, you'll see there, we're still making 160 horsepower at 4,000 RPM. Unfortunately, my driver was often dropping down to 3,000 where you're not even making 100, really. Or you might be, but really, it's around 100. And that's just the way the engine is. I mean, I could probably have done a better job of it if I really wanted to do a better job of it. But <laughs> I just decided I was happy with it ultimately, and I left it at that. I might not even need four valves per cylinder, to be honest. But hey, that's the way I built it. Overall, though, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. It's unconventional and kind of sporty. It does seem odd, though, that despite appearing to be the kind of better balanced, more sporty version of the Burnside with less overall weight, but it still is very slow. 60. Slower still. I mean, the Burnside had brutal torque. I'm only guessing that's what put it ahead. Especially since it had around 50 horsepower less than this. It would need the brutal torque. I think for once I've designed a classic car that doesn't look horrible. It definitely looks a lot better than the last model. It looks a lot nicer overall. I could probably change the tyres. I'm pretty sure even in the 50s you could build slightly better tyres than that, but 
we don't let you. Okay, so I think you'll find we have a bit of a predicament here. I have built a 3.5 litre V8 with a dual overhead cam setup and 4 valve per cylinder. But the thing that interests me is I'm able to get 233 horsepower and naturally less torque due to the smaller size from a smaller engine. So I'm thinking if I go back to my inline 6 and try this technology, I may just be able to build a competitive inline 6, but I'm not certain, I'll have to see. So I'll return when I have completed that. Okay, so with the size unchanged, the direct acting overhead cam is able to give me 140 horsepower. Now I'm going to drive the same thing with overhead cam of 4, 3 and 2 valve per cylinder to see how that works. And now it's looking like dual overhead cam is really the only option. Now we have 2 and 4 valve per cylinder. Judging by what I test with overhead cam, I think 4 will be better, but I'll test them both anyway. And I've stupidly, stupidly forgotten to mess with the RPM to see how that affects it. We'll see your dual overhead cam is webbing a little higher than the single was. So I'll try some more technologies here. If I'm reading this correctly, 4 valve per cylinder dual overhead cam is exactly the same as single overhead cam. Although, I've not tested for actual bottom end damage yet, so I'll do that. Now here we've got an interesting ordeal, the power is getting quite close to where I was with a V8, yet yeah, I've had to use about a litre more capacity, however, the pricing in itself is very very similar to the V8, despite the extra capacity, so I don't think it's doing too badly actually, I mean I, I can't deny it, the V8 is a better engine for this kind of vehicle, but it just feels all very very typical and to me at least, I feel that a inline 6 just suits this vehicle much better. I feel it suits the kind of class I'm going for with it. Since I'm not just trying to build a brutal muscle car, I'm trying to build something that has sophistication. I'm trying to build something that is a thing of beauty. And a V8 to me is just a performance engine. It's not really there to be a miracle of engineering or anything. Still, I'll continue tuning and reach you again when I've found my woot. There's a real temptation here to essentially bribe myself out of trouble. Like, I can max out the quality on these two and I can get more power and I can get less engine problems. I mean, it's just so tempting, but then, as I said, I'm essentially bribing myself out of the challenge. And there's no fun in that, really. I will add plus five, though. I mean, I know it's a lot. It's about as high as I dare go, but it's really helping the engine, so I have to have some quality on. 
I mean, especially this. The others I'm going to leave on zero, they don't make much difference, but these few in particular, they help a lot. Now I've pulled myself into a real problem here. The engine weighs 222 kilos at the moment, well, close enough to that, and I like that about it, only it's making 199 horsepower. I really do want the front end of a car to be light, but at the same time I want to go full muscle in line 6 and get loads of power. So, it does make it slightly confusing. Now, I like this as a 305 horsepower engine, it's 5.5 litres, but still, I like the power. However, we have a problem naturally, the torque limit of the pistons. I could try and change it to heavy duty cast, although that comes with its own problems, like the RPM. I'll have to keep experimenting, I guess. Which one will I decide? I can choose between bottom end problems or top end problems. Hmm, such a difficult decision to make. I've honestly taken about 13 cc's off the vehicle and that was just enough to fix it. So that the only problem I've got is valve float. I mean pretty extreme valve float mind but still the bottom end is entirely safe. However, 5700 RPM we have problems with the bottom end. 5500 RPM we have problems with the bottom end. It hangs in a real tight balance here. But I think I've made a decent engine. There is a bit of runoff after the max power at uh, 5100 RPM. You get 500 RPM for it to drop off. I know it's not a lot, but as I've said, it hangs in the balance so tightly. I could just adjust one thing and the RPM could fly up to 5300 as well, which would give me even less drop off. The exhaust, you'll see, I can actually make it larger and kind of drop the power off in the mid-range which is odd. The power in the mid-range is stronger with a smaller exhaust. And the carburettors. We'll see 903 there. I could change it to single barrel, get a bit more power. But I decided to go with the economy. I mean, I'm able to make the power I want from this engine. So... Here's what we've got. It's not actually that much more money than the V8 mine, so I've just had to make the engine massive and increase some quality settings in order to compete. And look at that. The height is struggling. It's still got plenty of space around it. It's just struggling for height, which is odd. I thought the car had plenty of height in the engine bay. Apparently it's struggling still. I'm going to look in and there'll be loads, so won't there? Now let's just let the engine run and I'll be quiet for a moment. There we go, and what else have we got here? We've got the transmission. We don't want an automatic. Uh, miles per gallon is decent still, thanks to those eco carburetors, we're able to increase the power without doing stupid, stupid things to it. 
The top speed can be increased. You were saying 148 for a moment there. If only we could actually hit that kind of speed, that would be craziness. Now I'm thinking there is one modification I want to make though, and I know it's a very very early day, perhaps even too early to properly do a unitary construction, but I really do want a unitary construction since it will make the vehicle a lot lighter, and we'll go with double wishbone all around, it's the best suspension we can get, unless we go with McPherson and trailing arm, that's what I was originally intending to go with. You know, it does the job, it's semi-independent on the way, but it's not over the top for price. Unfortunately, the only front available on a ladder frame is double wishbone, which is annoying. We need to set up for comfort, and brace ourselves for the weight balance. 54.5% front, so it's not got that much worse than the old 54% front. The unitary construction helps, again I messed around with that earlier and it did give me better weight balance. It's heavier as well, 1607 kilos, but it's not too stupid considering how powerful this thing is. I mean these engines are heavy. There we go, 8.9, I'm happy with that, and we do have some higher end gearing as well, so even if the top speed is ultimately slower, I feel the balance improvements of a unitary construction and the natural weight improvements will help this vehicle out a fair amount. Anyway, we can finally take this thing round Nürburgring again and hope to get a brilliant time with it, if all goes well. So let's go. Okay, so the car set a 10 minutes 16.76 time, which is just over 8 seconds slower than the Ford Transit. Mine that did have a Dodge Viper driving in front of it and a bunch of parts taken off for weight saving. Also, Transit handles surprisingly well. I mean, I've driven the Super Sport van in Forza. It handles better than you would believe a ladder framed van could. Either way, this is a car from 1953. So to compete with a Transit that's 50 years newer is not half bad if you ask me. I mean, I guess it's just the refinements, the changes in suspension to something more appropriate to the upgraded brakes and tyres I've done over the original car. have overall just made it a slightly better handling, but also quicker car. And that's what I was going for, ultimately, when I did hike up the size and power. You'll see the price is pretty high. We could actually make a bit more profit, I think charge 19,000 for it, we can make 7% profit, but that's not bad. It's actually surprisingly cheap, I mean 19,000 for a truly American beauty of a car isn't too bad. And I'm happy with the engine now. It's not what I was originally going for, I was originally going for lighter, simpler, more agile, better balanced, but it works. Only unfortunately I've forgotten something plainly obvious to my eyes that should have been done a long time ago. Now we need a head, that's 280s, that one looks appropriate. And it has to be blue, because channel colours, okay? We need blue and silver, or chrome, either works. Because that's the core two duo colours, yay! Can't call it our own without those colours though. Still, I like me car, as I was saying. And finally, I'm happy to leave it at this. So, goodbye, until another day.